Hello and welcome to the Lehi and Bainbridge class. Now, I have to admit, I was very tempted. I was tempted to start off in Academies because someone accused me of making up words for Academies' for the sake um, on yesterday's video. I haven't. I chose not to. I was also tempted to start picking up on dialects because, let's be honest, my lexicon of the English language includes some Scottish words which I'm fairly sure are not part of the Oxford English Dictionary and some Cornish words which are uh, definitely not part of the Oxford English Dictionary thanks to being a Cornish and Scottish family. Includes engineeries which is definitely not part of the Oxford English Dictionary and um, then there's histories which is a completely other branch. And the thing is, I was sitting there thinking about it and wondering, A, why this person's blood pressure was going quite so high over me using a phrase which my dad had used countless times when I was growing up and was quite a normal thing for him to come out with along with a whole set of other phrases. And I suddenly realised that you can have a very narrow view of English as a language. And you can see it as this simple black and white thing. This text. And it's all that. And it's like that with ships. People see them as this black and white thing. They're, they're either this or they're that. And very rarely does a ship t sit in a box completely simply in that box and it's just it's there often it's a bit of a judgment call again a re another recent discussion i had over was whether a certain cruiser a certain vessel a very cute vessel but a a, a certain vessel called long beach was the last american cruiser or not and people came up with the virginias well the virginias come from the lehe class they're part of this design group, which is interesting because they start off as destroyer leaders and then they get turned into cruisers because of, well, in 1975, the US Navy does a cruiser realignment. Why do they do a cruiser realignment? Well, there are various arguments for why this is, but let's be honest, the biggest reason is closing the cruiser gap with the Soviets. The Soviets had defined guided missile cruisers as large warships armed with long-range anti-ship missiles. The U.S. Navy defined these uh, defined these ships as frigates. Now, here's the point. Honestly, and here's the dirty little secret: the U.S. Navy was probably right, because let's be honest, the reason why a cruiser came about in existence as a term. And why that entered history as something. And why that word came about and changed. And had an actual ship ascribed to it rather than being a role. Was because frigates had become the battleships. With HMS Warrior and others like her. When the ironclad frigate becomes the battleship. English had changed. Frigate now meant multiple things. And the US Navy had used a frigate classification. But trouble is, everyone else was still using cruiser. And so the US Navy was worried. Well, let's be honest, the politicians were worried. They might actually have to fund some more ships. That'd be scary. So they changed. their phraseology. Cruisers became guided missile cruisers. Frigates became guided missile cruisers, destroyers, or guided missile destroyers, depending on whether they were destroyer leaders. So the DLGNs and the DLGs became guided missile cruisers. And the Iranian frigates became destroyers or guided missile destroyers, depending on what it were. Destroyers were all divided into destroyer or guided missile destroyer. The ocean escorts, the Ds and uh, destroyer escorts and destroyer escorts guided missile, became frigates or guided missile frigates, FFs or FFGs. And patrol frigates became 
guided missile frigates as well. And the Tikaronga class went from guided missile destroyers in 1980 to guided missile cruisers. And someone has recently told me, well, the difference between a cruiser and a destroyer is one carries the extended range of missiles. And that doesn't really surprise me, but that's not really enough of a differentiation that I should be making an entire classification based on it. One carries the extended range of missile versus the other. It does not justify on itself necessarily having something called a destroyer or a cruiser. I could see you calling it a destroyer leader because it carries that, uh, those, uh, that extended range weapon, but it would still be a variant of a destroyer. Yes! Welcome to the beautiful world of nuance and context. Yes, things can change. Phraseology can change. The lexicon of very few, many people is far wider than the lexicon which might exist in a dictionary. Another phrase I used earlier was historians and academies. Well, in academia, there are lots of words which are in use which are not in the dictionary. And which you would probably have to look up the course uh, course guides, etc. If you were in a class and you weren't hadn't been there from the beginning when they explained those for the phraseologies, you would probably be go going through a course guide going, ah, that's what the prof means. And that's if the prof's nice and put it in the course guide. Sometimes they'll expect you to either figure it out or to have done the reading, which you're supposed to do around the course, and it will be mentioned in the reading, so it will give you an explanation, give you an explanation because it's a phraseology which a certain professor or another academic has developed to describe a particular uh, continuation or variance of a theory or something they are working on under certain circumstances. And it will sound similar to things, but it also sound different. It's the joy of it. And then you get into the whole different phraseologies that academics, historians can use to describe archaeologists, archaeologists describe historians. It's great fun. And we haven't even got into the whole science versus arts, different sciences, debates, ooh, physics versus biology. Oh, that's always fun. You want to listen to a good debate? You listen to physicists and biologists describing each other's t systems in phraseologies they themselves use so they can pretend the other one doesn't exist. <laughs> it's great fun. And he's sitting there going, Hang on, aren't you two describing the exact same thing? Yes, but that's not. they don't use the right phrase for it. Well, no, a physicist discovered it on this, this, this date. Ah, from that angle, but a biologist discovered it on this date, which is earlier, from this angle. Da, 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 and it's it just goes on for ages. It's fun to watch. Then you think, frankly, that um, the whole idea that the sciences and engineerings and mathematics are more logical and sensible than the artistic, su uh, su uh, artistic subjects, well, the so-called artistic subjects. I'm not quite sure how arty, how arty history really is. I can understand why it's considered more of an art than a science, but... Um, I'm also not quite sure. I, I am definitely sure I do not have the skills of Picasso or painting. I just don't. But it's fun. It's fun to watch. So, here are the class. And first things first, please look down at the bottom at Bainbridge. Now, remember, Bainbridge is technically a modified Lehane. And yet she's laid down in May 1959. Lei is named down, laid down in December 1959. Lehe is launched in July 1961. Bainbridge is launched in April 1961. Okay. Now, I will say this. Lehe gets built a lot quicker than Bainbridge. So you don't have the whole Kirov Slava thing going on of the Slavas taking longer to build than the Kirovs because of the yard and uh, various other reasons. Um, but then Bainbridge is commissioned in October 1962. Lehe commissioned in August 1962. 
so not that far apart. And Bainbridge stays in service till September 1996. She was a Quincy-built ship, which speaks of good things. As said, I've described Quincy as, at points, the American equivalent to Camelettes. So if you've got a good ship being built by them, you're going to want to keep it around. Bath Iron Works built Lehi, Harry, Yanel, and uh, Warden. New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden built Dale and Richmond K. Turner. Lockheed Shipbuilding Construction Company, Seattle, built Gridley. Todd Shipyard, San Pedro, built England. San Francisco Naval Shipyard, built Hel uh, Helsey. And that, that's, read my notes. Helsey, yes. For some reason, I, in my notes, I have it spelt wrong. We'll leave that to one side. And Reeves was built by Pungent and Pungent Sound, well, Puja Sound, Naval Shipyard, Bremerton. And yes, they were all DLGs originally. So, you will find for most of these ships, they have different classification numbers depending on when they are. Let me explain. When first launched, Lehe is DLG-16. Then she's reclassified as CG-16. So, she's just launched as a destroyer leader. Now, what are the differences between a destroyer leader and a cruiser? Well, <clears throat> imagine a destroyer-built cruiser. You said, then going... Alex, what are you talking about? Driver class destroyer? Mm, yes and no. Yes and no. Certainly it can step up and do some of the cruiser roles. So they are, to an extent, a follow-on from the tribals and those sort of destroyers. But imagine it's sort of a case of we are building something which is larger than your average destroyer sized. Probably not as large as you'd build a cruiser at this point. But it's built to destroy levels of framing, destroy levels of structure, destroy levels of armoring and shaping. And it's built with a destroyer mindset. There is a difference. So let's consider them. Well, the place on Alehi, full, uh, fully loaded, was 7,800 tons. Okay. There are cruisers built smaller than her. But there again, most of those cruisers were built smaller than her prior to, some of them during World War II. But basically, those cruisers were the cruisers which had the role of destroyer leader anyway. They might have been cruiser built vessels, but they were destroyer leaders in their functionality. Top speed 32 knots. 80,000 and 5,000 shaft horsepower. Always fun to have 85,000 shaft horsepower. A whole massive suite of radars. Luckily, stuff we've covered in previous videos. Two Mark 10 Seria, 10 Seria, uh, Terrier Sams. One Azeroth ASW system, four three-inch 76 mm guns in, well, that's two twin turrets, replaced by Harpoon missiles during the 1980s. During the period when people thought, missiles are everything you need. And I'm fairly sure that's supposed to be two phalanx close weapon systems. But now looking at it, it looks like I've written TWP. And I'm not sure what TWP stands for, but apparently Microsoft Office didn't notice a difference either. <laughs> so, apologies. Oh. 
And then we have the Bainbridge, which is 9,100 tonnes. So, it's an extra 1,300 tonnes. It's an extra 10.1 metres. It's an extra 0.6 metres of beam. It's an extra 0.9 metres of draft at maximum. It's got 60,000 shaft horsepower, but has a top speed of 34 knots. Range, functionally unlimited. Let's be honest, functionally unlimited. And sensor-wise, well, it has the ASP-10, um, the 37 Cert Radar, which isn't fitted on the previous one, on the Lehis. It's got the 52 3D Air Search Radar. Mm -hmm. It's got four ANSPJ 55 Terrier Far Control Radars. About the same which are fitted on Lehis. And it's got an ANSQS 26 Sonar. So it's a slightly more, I would say, energy, heavy duty fit of sensors. But that is the advantage. You have got a nuclear reactor. You know, it's <coughs> it's like um okay. Another conversation that's happened recently, and I haven't really engaged with this because this person made this comment and I was sitting there going that that's fun and their basic point was lasers aren't going to work until you have fusion reactors and I was sitting there going well lasers do sort of work we've done some testing we are deploying some variants they're not working as we'd hope they work and basically you're going for fusion reactors well fusion reactors are even further away from working than lasers probably are but leaving that to one side most of our problem with lasers seems to be not the amount of power we can put into them. It's getting that power to actually work through them. We have a drop down of throughput. So, if you're planning on the design remaining as inefficient as it currently is, and just cranking up more power to get a, a actual something to work, well, that's going to be a very expensive methodology to do it, because... Rather like with battle cruisers versus battleships, people always presume when I start talking about these things that the battleship is going to be a more expensive thing. But I have to explain to them, armor is relatively cheap. Speed is expensive. Why is speed expensive? Because engines and controlling all that power, that's expensive. That's difficult. That's why battle cruisers often carried less guns and less armor, and yet we're a lot more expensive than their battleship counterparts, as a rule. You can find battleships which are more expensive than battle cruisers, especially if you start going through between different years and go, uh -huh, look, this battleship costs more costs more than this battle cruiser did. And you go, yes. Um, but you found a battleship which was built four or five years after they built that battle cruiser. I'm not surprised it costs more. Besides, it's a Queen Elizabeth class, and you're talking about an Invincible class. There's a slight difference between those ships. It's not just, it's also the fact that the Queen Elizabeth class is about as fast as the Invincibles. <laughs> In practical terms. <sighs> so, the Rim 2 Terrier. Now, personally, I have to admire anyone who has the confidence to call their missile system a Terrier. Because that's a big thing to live up to. As anyone who has ever seen a Terrier in anything approaching combat will know, they have absolutely no qualms, no fears, and they will jump. They really will. They are very, very fast as well. And when it's something they care about, they're protecting. Mm-hmm. My aunt is a lifelong owner of West Highland Terriers. They are small white missiles the moment you upset her or anyone else who they decide is theirs. 
And when I say a small white missile, I mean I'm fairly sure the paws do not touch the ground. The only thing you can go for which is slightly more a aspirational than Terrier would be calling it the Corgi. Because even that would definitely have no concept at all of it's not the right missile for the job. It just wouldn't. It would be... It would be giving it such a name, it would either live up to it or be completely disappointing. Now, this missile went through massive changes while in service. Okay? When it first enters service, it is a beam riding, wing control, sub -targets, uh, subsonic targets only system. It's the RIM 2A. By the time you get to the final version, the RIM 2F, you're dealing with a semi active radar homing system, tail control, and it has a rocket motor which can really allow it to hit anything it wants to. There is also a D variant which has double the range of the original system and has a nuclear warhead a, a option. The F variant comes after the D. It starts off as being top speed of only one point, Mach 1.8, a range of 10 nautical miles. And yeah, that's it. That That's fine for when it enters service. That is something cool. It's a mid-1950s sort of weaponish. However... And I say, however, the next variant they bring in is the RIM 2C, which introduce tail control rather than wing control, which makes it more precise. Uh, the forward control fins were replaced with fixed strikes, the tail, uh, allowing the tail to become the control surface. It also got a new motor, a featured extended range, and could get up to Mach 3, along with better maneuverability. Now, supersonic targets start to be an option. Mm -hmm. Then, it gets better still. And it keeps getting better. But, and this is a point which has to be made on this system, the Terrier is the primary missile system used on US Navy crews and guided missile frigates built during the 1960s. And it is there because it could be installed on smaller ships than the Remate Talos, which is larger, long-ranged, but very, very... How do I put this? Very, uh... Oh, um... Uh, we need to put in this, this, this. This thing is far more able to be robustly organized. Let's put it this way. You don't have to have as many bells and whistles to take care of it. It isn't, it isn't a prima donna as much as the Talos system is. The Talos system will ask you whether there is a Y in the day of the week and whether that should affect whether it should function or not. And you'd better have the right oils, prayers, and other systems to the machine god, the Ominousar, in order to get it to work. If not, mm -hmm. and for those who don't know, that was a Warhammer 40k reference. Terra installation usually consisted of one Mark 10 twin arm launcher with 40 round rear loading magazines. However, some magazines were 60 or 80 rounds, and Boston and Canberra, which used bottom-loading magazines, carried 72 rounds. And the point in the whole reason for the standard missile is it replaced the Terrier because it offers the range and capability of the RIM-8 Talos in a missile the size of the Terrier. That's a useful system. 
And then we have Azrock. Now, for those of you who aren't a fan, let me tell you why you're wrong to not be a fan of Azrock, and why having more systems like this still in service would be quite useful. Even if they were VLS systems, having the extra VLS tubes and filling them in would be useful. Azrock originally used this Mark 112 matchbox launcher. It's a, it's eventually replaced with a VLS system, but that was cool. And basically what happens is this. So, you have a problem going on. If your helicopter or your patrol aircraft spots a submarine, and especially in the earlier 1950s, 60s, it may or may not be carrying enough weapons to engage that submarine, If it is, great. If it isn't, it calls up near a ship with Azrock, and torpedoes will lost into the area. And, oh, for extra fun, they have a nuclear depth charge in service in 1961. Never officially used in more than, uh, well, one or two is the exact phraseology, tests before the uh, nuclear test ban treaty banning underwater nuclear tests went into effect. However, 575 of these interesting devices were produced. Never used in combat, thankfully. Never used in combat. But, with an operational range of 6 miles, It's a useful system. It is a useful. It could carry a Mark 96 torpedo, a Mark 46 torpedo, sorry. Or a 96.8 pounds charge. Or a PBNXN high explosive. And, or a 10 kiloton nuclear depth charge. Depending on your particular desire. Still in service today with the uh, JS, uh, JMSDF, Japanese Maritime Salt Defense Force, and um, Taiwan. And of course, it eventually developed into, well, still in use. But the other system which was developed from it was Subrock, which was... Um, Another fun system. It's basically the idea of, you're not in torpedo range of my submarine. Don't worry. We have a rocket which will launch and will drop a nuclear depth charge on you. Why do I like these systems? Because, honestly, to me, it represents the solution to the problem you saw coming about in World War II. And you do, to an extent, see this today. And even if we end up with drones being used as extra anti-submarine warfare aircraft on escorts, you are going to run into the problem of the more you need to carry a drone which needs to fulfill all the roles of a helicopter, i.e. both carrying the deployable sonar and maybe magnetic anomaly detector and other systems, as well as weapons. The bigger the drone gets, the less of them you'll be able to carry and the less disposable they get. If I was implementing a system with ships right now, I would probably be looking at rotary drones of some kind, not that big. Big enough to I need the camera unit I need, probably a surface search radar system of some kind, and a dipping sonar. And deployable sonar boys as well would be quite good. Why? Because I could probably build that so not big enough that I could be carrying twelve or so of them as long as one helicopter. And then I could probably keep three or four of them up. 
which means I could probably triangulate a submarine quite easily because if I could have three of those dipping sonar, those dipping sonars around that submarine, I know exactly where it is. And I'm coordinating that data back on my ship. Maybe I have another one flying as comms relay if the satellite system's down. And if I have something like this, well, I just go poof, and drop it in. And I can use my crewed helicopter. A crewed, as in C-E-R-E-W-E-D, for doing further or greater distance operations. For prosecuting threats as far away from me as possible. I'd probably want to be able to loft ideally greater than torpedo range. If I can loft that torpedo to further away than the torpedo can go, then I've got a good, good system. And again, I can loft multiples of those. Helicopter might carry two, four of them. If you're really, really fast, a really, a really aggressive submarine captain, I can loft enough of those into the water that when they hit, you're going to be in trouble. And again, the precision guidance of having three of those UAVs providing me with the dipping sonar data, that's enough. It's a good system. It's a system based on the experience of World War II, where, let's be honest, you'd had things like the flag class, etc., had had to break lock in order to do a depth chart run. Or they had to have another one maintaining the watch while they, uh, someone else did the depth chart run. And that's why they developed Hedgehog and then the other systems that came after it. Well... Meet Hedgehog. And I have a feeling that Azrock is going to be one of those techno one of those technologies. I'm going to talk about that became came into service before its time in the top five mentions that came into service before they could, you know, were sadly before their time. Because my view is it's been eliminated mostly as a cost saving measure. Not because it's actually a sensible thing to eliminate. Ah, Lehe. Well, as mentioned, she has an interesting construction program. Once she's commissioned, she's sent for a shakedown cruise in the Caribbean. Oh, it's a hard life. It's a hard life. We're going for a shakedown cruise in the Caribbean. I am I'm distraught. She returned to Boston in September 1963 and then went to Charleston in South Carolina where Rear Admiral E. Grimm, Commander Cruiser Destroyer Flotilla 6, selected her as his flagship. I can't think why. Let's see. Brand new ship coming into service. I'm going to select. I might not select that as my flagship. Depends. Am I a or am I a Beatty? Do I always want to be in the newest, bestest thing? Or do I have enough self-control I can realise when I don't need to be? Then she returned to the Caribbean for a warfare exercises and then eventually for missile training, which ended in February 1964. Uh, in April 1964, she took part in an amphibious exercise. Uh, quick kick V F5, and in June is permanently assigned to destroy a squadron six. Mm -hmm. She then departed for duty with Sixth Fleet on the 17th of July as part of a fast carrier task force. This was centered on the Forestal, and participated in some exercises out there, including Medland X64 between the Balearic Islands and Sardinia. Then carried out some independent training in the Eastern Mediterranean before departing from Naples, Italy in September 1964 to take part in Phallic 64. She returns to Naples in October and in November takes part in another fleet-wide exercise, Poop Deck 4. 
Okay, again. There is someone who starts off in the Royal Navy, I'm fairly sure, naming Royal Navy exercises. And then at some point in the 1960s, seems to somehow transfer across to the US Navy for the US Navy's exercise and naming. I'm not sure who they are, but they need to be kept away from exercise naming. I do not know who they are, I emphasize, but if you know who they are and their details, please, whenever they suggest they're going to be in a planning meeting about exercises, abduct them. Not, don't do anything nasty to them, I'm not suggesting any harm or anything. I mean, schedule them an appointment with someone who is incredibly boring, who never runs to time, and will keep them occupied for at least three or four days. Once the decision's made, and there's a decent name for the, uh, for the exercise, they can be let out. But just just keep them busy, okay? That's basically what I mean. Keep them busy. And that pretty much describes most of her career. It's exercises, 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 exercises. In 1975, she's reclassified as a cruiser. She's transferred in 1976 to the Pacific Fleet. Makes her home in San Diego. And goes through new threat modernization. And, well, from roughly 1986 to 1988. Before returning to regular duty Pacific Fleet in 1990. It te she's technically in duty uh, from 1988, but it's in but it takes to 1990 for her to be worked up enough that she starts doing some various important things. I, you get the ship back. You got all not sorts of new gear in it. The crew need to work out how to use the new gear. You need to work out how you're going to fit the new ship you know, the new ship now because it's all been modernised in your systems, and it takes a while to do so. And then she helps direct United Nations UNS, uh, UNOSM relief flights into Mogadishu as Somalia as part of Operation Restore Hope. And she then takes part in 1993 in the no-fly zone in southern Iraq after being in 1991 being part of Operation Desert Storm. She won a Battle E Award for Outstanding Combat Preparedness in 1993. At the time, she was the oldest conventional cruiser in the United States Navy. Let's be honest, oldest conventional destroyer leader. But we'll be, we'll be nice to them. We'll be nice to the US Navy. We'll say we believe them. We believe you. When you convert by the power of pen from destroyer leader to cruiser, we believe you, US Navy. We believe you. Did you by any chance at the same time rebuild the entire internal hull structure? Anything? No? Okay. Yarnall. Well, Yarnall's career is... the same, really. It's funny to think about, but... there are a whole sway of ships which are built in the 1960s in one of the tensest times the world has ever seen. They serve for roughly 30, 30, 40 years. They maybe take part in Vietnam. They maybe take part in the first Gulf War. But the naval war they were built for never happens. It doesn't. Let's be honest, even the Falklands War, vaunted as it is for experience, and we are by this point now further away from the Falklands War than the Falklands War was from World War Two. And we have been for a while. It didn't have battle group on battle group combat. Argentinian battle groups came out 
they had a rhino with a submarine and decided that they really didn't want to be sunk because, let's be honest, as with most dictatorships, they're kind of hollow bullies. In fact, dictatorships, whether they're from the left or right, are pretty much just bullies. In that, they are obsessed with the image of looking strong, but tends to be the moment you stand up to them and actually stare them down or pop them on the nose and watch them drop to the ground. I'm not suggesting you do that, by the way. Whatever I might teach my little cousins is not stuff I advise on YouTube. Even when I teach my little cousins, there are disclaimers. It's all about making sure they have options and contingencies for situations which can't be foreseen. It's not about actually doing it. Yarnell is a good example of this. She spends her entire career going around the world being a couple of heartbeats away from a global war. And yet, she never gets it. And believe it or not, I'm glad she never gets it, but there is part of me which looks at these ships and goes, it would have been interesting. It would have indeed been interesting. Warden? Again. Simmer. This is her refilling alongside the USS Willamette. In 1986. And she really does pack in her career. Her career is one long peacetime presence and global reach mission. She you know, does operation in the Gulf of Tonkin in 1973 and other points in her career. She's the She's actually hit in a blue on blue by AGM 45 Shrike anti radiation missiles fired from a support aircraft during the uh, airstrike on Haipong. Um, in 1972 she operates with the Korean Navy Japanese Navy she does all sorts of things she's always going around being a present ship she even takes part in the first Gulf War And yet, her end is as part of a sync X. <laughs> yep, a sync exercise. These ships. They're serving, they're going into tense situations. They are, I would say, incredibly underarmed for their period. They really are. In that, you would think being not so long since World War II, and the memories of World War II, that the desire to festoon them with every weapon going would still be present in the US Navy, but no. They don't still have it. But still, they carry very potent missiles for their time. And for a while, they do have three inch air guns, which are probably very useful, but again, she does get replaced by harpoons, which give them more missiles, give them anti ship missile capability. And they still got phalanx, which in this period is not that bad. I might be more I'm more worried about it today, but that's mainly because I think the stopping range and requirements for stopping a hypersonic weapon are slightly further and slightly bigger. 
than the requirements for stopping a subsonic or even supersonic weapon. Hmm. As for USS Dale, well, again, it's much the same career. She was decommissioned in 1970 after being launched in 19 and launched and commissioned in 1962 63 and taken through a modernization at Bath in Maine to increase the flexibility of her combat systems. This included fitting of the Naval Tactical Data System, which was at this point new. And that's a trouble. This is another thing, point about with missile systems. Um, <clears throat> a missile in itself it can be very capable. But if you've got the most capable missile system in the world, but your system can only allow you to fire and launch one missile at a time, and only guide one missile at a time, it's probably not going to be as helpful as a missile which is 70% as capable as your system, as your missile, but you can launch two dozen at a time. It might be a less capable missile, but you can launch 24 of them. That is the point. So having something like the Naval Tactical Dis uh, Data System added in can really enhance our capabilities. In 1974, she selected as the operational platform for newly deployed ANSPS-49 2D air search radar. This meant she spent quite a lot of 1974 and 75 in the Caribbean, getting it tested out. Again, I'm sure a hardship for the crew, because uh, crew, it's really hard to be told. You have to sail around the Caribbean now. Woohoo! Do we get to do some port visits while we're there? Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Sailors being told they can go to one of the world's best producers of rum. Admittedly, this doesn't do much for me as they don't produce iron brew, but... Most sailors do enjoy rum, or at least like to affect that they do. They'll all have about one glass of it. and go, yeah, we're rum. I don't know the case of... So, um, can we have that, uh, you know, that, 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 um, swirly, co uh, uh, swirly, swirly cocktail thingy? Yeah, we're drunk, so now we don't realise what we're ordering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it happen, the farm in different terms. In 1983... She took part in exercise with British and uh, with other U.S. ships and British ships, and managed to collide with one of the remaining Type Twenty Ones, which had survived the Falklands War, HMS Ambuscade. And of course, lost a couple, some, a couple of members in the Falklands War. This resulted in serious damage to Ambuscade's bow, and enough damage to have Dale dry docked when she returned to Jacksonville, Florida. She actually had to have people flown in from USS America, uh, one of the Kitty Hawk class supercarriers, to help her crew make satisfactory repairs. Enough to keep her seaworth again to get her some Mediterranean. Ah, Richmond K. Turner, AK, for Admiral Kelly Turner. Now, this is her with USS Nicholas. Uh, underway in the South China Sea, somewhere in around 1966. She spent a lot of time on search and rescue in the Tonkin Gulf in 1965. Had a fairly decent career. Went for a major refit in 1971 at Bath Ironworks. This, of course, appeared when the U.S. Navy is doing a major fleet-wide upgrade, of course. It's the NTSD, NTSD. And she keeps going in. She seems to have a pattern of a couple of deployments and then let's see if we can't send her in for either advanced testing or advanced training. At one point, she is um, 
sent after an overhaul at Charles Naval Shipyard to the Fleet Training Centre at Guantanamo Bay for the refresher training. In 1978. She gets there for training and then just happens to be one of the most upgraded ships available and oh the Soviet units are operating in the West Indies. Please go and intercept and conduct surveillance on them. She then goes for a transit through the Panama Canal and conducts surveillance operations on the west coast of Niagara. Nicaragua. Sorry, I called it after the uh, waterfall rather than the uh, rather than the actual um, state. And she takes part in well, pretty much all the operations in the Persian Gulf from about 1988 onwards, and goes off to Bosnia and ends her career taking part in the Syncax. The Air Force dropped three two thousand pound bombs on her. Surprising enough, that was enough to sink her. Gridley. Ah, oh, Gridley's career. Well, she seems to spend a lot of her life with carriers. A lot of her life. In fact, she served the shotgun for Ranger, Constellation and Kitty Hawk during in the Gulf of Tonkin in the 1970s. In 1976, she also spent some time with the Midway Battle Group. Then she uh, had fun with the USS Okinawa Battle Group. Yeah, the LPH. Before getting back to her traditional home, which is, of course, aircraft carriers. I.e. the Ranger. She liked to surf of aircraft carriers, and yeah, she even did USS Independence. Eventually, gets upgraded to um, accommodate the new SM two ER Block three missile, which is what most of them do end up getting eventually. The extended range, Room sixty seven. Which is a decent system and very good to replace your Terrier missile with. And it can replace Talos as well, let's be honest. But in that way, it's actually an easier fit to replace Terrier because it's not too different to Terrier in size and shape. So it's actually an easier conversion to replace a Terrier system or a standard Room 67 standard than it is to replace a Talos system. You have to do less work. Then we have England. Not named for the country, named for John C. England, who was an officer in the USN who died on USS Oklahoma after his torpedo and sank in uh, Pearl Harbor. There was someone who was once talking to me, going, Oh, yes, they named it for like, the US Navy, they named a ship for England, but not for Scotland and Wales. And I went, It's not that England. It also has caused one of the most misconstrued quotes of Ernest King as well. Uh, There'll always be in England the United States Navy, is what he declared and promised. He declared this after the uh, first USS England, the D-635, sank six enemy submarines in 12 days in May 1944. Pretty good. However, it does lead, as said, to some interesting conversations sometimes. Specifically with people who are looking for a gripe. They really are hunting for a gripe. USS Halsey? I wonder who that's named for. Now, my feeling has always been the motto of this ship should have been bull in a china shop, but no, they decided not to go with that. So, anyway, she spends most of her life with Destroyer Squadron 7, Destroyer Division 71 in the Pacific Ocean Fleet. She does a lot of work with them. She 
She also likes to turn up to the Pacific Missile Range on a fairly regular basis and try and set records. Doesn't always achieve them, but does try and like to, like to set them. Well, try to. Reeves. Name for uh, J Joseph Mason Bull Reeves. Interesting enough, known as the father of carrier aviation in the US Navy. Hmm. It's good to have one of those. He's a good. Uh, he is a good officer to name a ship after. Royal Navy's never had an HMS Henderson, sadly enough. Mm. She took part in a lot of Operation Ernest Will, oper uh, Ernest Will, tanker flagging operations in 1987. Um, she had another career, like I've described already. She's going around. She's doing visits. She goes to King da uh, Kung Dao or Tsingtao in the People's Republic of China for a historic six-day port visit in 1986. First time a US Navy vessel had visited China since the USS Dixie, a Navy repair ship, departed in 1949. She went along with USS Rents, Oldendorf, one of those, of course, a uh, lovely Oliver has a, per a Perry class frigate, and the other one, of course, a Sprunt's class destroyer. And she leads them, leads them in. Status, presence, all important. Then we have Bainbridge. Bainbridge, of course, is already featured in this series of discussion. It was um, the destroyer as part of this battle group, and Long Beach is back up while escorting Enterprise around the world. It has a longer career than any of the Ilahi class. It's commissioned earlier than pretty much all but all but Lehi. Mm -hmm. And it is a really successful vessel. It is. <sighs> Taking part in this deployment in Operation Sea Orbit is just a major status thing. It's a big thing for the US Navy to do, and it sets a benchmark which you can argue that the Soviet Navy then with its nuclear ships is trying to re reach and attain into the 1980s because the US Navy has done it. And there is a reason why in 64 the US Navy goes around the world with sea orbit and then a couple of years later the Soviet Union announces that they've done a nuclear submarine orbit around the world. It's competition. It's Power plays, it's status. But she has a long career. This is her in the Suez Canal. This is her 1991. She took part of oper in Operation Sharp Guard, which was um, sanctioned against the former Republic of Yugoslavia, conducting 100 boardings of merchant vessels to inspect for illegal, car illegal cargo shipments. She also supported Operation Deny Flight and acting as Red Crown, coordinating the air warfare environment over Bosnia. Her anti-air warfare suite was so capable it could provide almost complete radar coverage over Bosnia and the Adriatic. And her SM-2ER missiles and the system she had built in meant that she could engage more than 16 aircraft to cruise missiles simultaneously at ranges in excess of 75 nautical miles. Remember what I said, it's the number of targets you can engage, the number of missiles you can launch, and the range of those missiles. Yes, you say, you've got a, I've got an anti-aircraft missile that can take you out 300 miles away. 
great. How many can you fire at once? Um, one. Okay, so you can get one up in the air at any one time. How long does it take to reach the 300 miles? Oh, f oh, they're really, really fast. Really, really fast? Really, really fast. They'll go, let's say, 900 miles an hour. Okay. 900 miles an hour, that's fast. 900 miles an hour is really fast. That's Mac 1.2. That's still going to take... 20 minutes to reach that 300 miles and let's say your incoming aircraft are doing 200 miles an hour they're not going max speed they're going you know not that fast they're doing let's say 600 miles an hour Your missile's gonna, you're gonna have a long time waiting to launch your next missile and your next missile. And if they dodge your missile, then you're really in trouble. So, yes, being able to launch a dozen missiles, 75 miles coverage, that is pretty darn good. So, how are the Leahy class? Well, they're sort of like trouble class destroyers. They're destroyers doing cruiser rolls, and they're built as destroyers. They're built with the idea that they might have to cover some cruiser rolls and provide some presence capabilities, but they're frigates. Destroyer leaders. They're eventually turned by the power of the pen into cruisers, but that doesn't make them actually cruisers. And it would be interesting to see what exactly a cruiser built at this time other than well let's be honest even Long Beach as lovely as she is she's a light cruiser build and they, that's one of the things it's, it's the heavy cruiser hulls which are needed we look at the conversion that's done to well yesterday's class the Albany uh, the Albany class that's the right one, isn't it? Albany. Yes. Which are two Oregon City vessels and a Baltimore class, which is basically... It was the, the Oregon City is a modified, later version, Baltimore class. Chicago's a Baltimore class. Albany and Columbus are... Chicago, are Oregon cities. Converted... Two missile cruisers. And they are heavy cruisers. Or rather, as heavy as you get under those scenarios. They're 17,500 tons fully loaded. Long Beach, 15,540 tons. These vessels are well. Even Bainbridge is down at 9,100 tons. The rest of them are down at 7,800 tons. They're almost half as light, half away, displaced half the displacement of those other ships. And yes, you do have a range of displacements. Yes. Look at the Arafusa class versus the town class, etc. But these are very light ships for designation cruiser in the period they are in. But still, they have capabilities. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting, the US Navy keep experimenting with nuclear power, nuclear weaponry, and the various systems it can deploy it by. And I'd say they're doing the smart thing. Look, I don't agree that you can make these vessels into cruisers and consider them full cruisers or complete cruisers overnight just by, the ch uh, just by changing their designation with a pen. I don't agree with that. I, I know I made jokes at the beginning, but I don't. There is a difference in how you build something, which is a cruiser versus a destroyer versus a, all these things. However, 
To me, that doesn't necessarily make the wrong thing. The US Navy, if they're thinking in the 1940, late 1940s, early 1950s, they're probably thinking they have a large fleet. They're thinking that the way the world's going, they're going to still have a large fleet. They're probably thinking that as long as they keep a large fleet, they'll eventually probably be able to build their own proper heavy cruisers again. But they want to try and get as much experience with nuclear power, etc., and all weapons before they do so. So, building these ships and building one of them as a nuclear powered vessel makes a lot of sense. Because it allows you to build up experience. It's kind of like Long Beach, that allows you to build up experience. Everything's about building your experience so that you can operate as you want to operate when you want to operate it. You can build what you want when you want to build it. It's kind of like an adapted version of what the, pro of the program eventually leads to Adrian's Warrior. But whereas the program led to Adrian's Warrior was in many ways more a case of, oh, we happen to have tried this out and it works, and we happen to have tried that out if it works. It's trying to take a structured, planned approach to it. The trouble with taking a structured, planned approach to it is A, you are taking a structured, planned approach to it, and B, people tend to get over and eager for delivery of the end result. Which actually, speaking of that, allows me to talk about quickly about some of the videos I've got coming up. Because some of the videos I've got coming up include one entitled Top 5 Inventions That Came Too Late To Be Useful and Top 5 Inventions That Came Too Early To Be Useful. And honestly, the things that are going to be mostly too early are the things which were announced, were going to deliver this, and then of course it's not ready in time, and therefore it flops, and it actually becomes quite a lot of effort to get people to look back at it with seriousness and to start looking forward and how to develop it, because they've been burnt. And that's a serious problem. Oh, no. It's an interesting class. It is an interesting class. What have we got coming up? Oh, we've got the Belknap class tomorrow. Then we have the 100 Years of Gun Cruisers on Thursday. Then we have US Nuclear Powered Cruisers on Friday. Uh, sort of overall discussion of them all and of the how they develop it as a program. Tikaronga class. US Treaty Cruisers in war and retrospect. Then 100 Years of Gun Cruisers, the recorded video. And then, oh, we've got those insect class. And then the top five inventions that came too early, and the top five inventions that came too late. Barrel Coronel live on Friday. Hmm. Hope you're going to enjoy it all. Take care, have fun, and thank you for watching. And today's question is going to be... Uh, A simple one because if you can, if the U.S. Navy had considered this part, continued this policy of, and I'm going to be talking about it again tomorrow, of basically for every eight to nine conventional vessels they build, they build a modified member of the class which is nuclear powered, and if we consider the Arleigh Burke class. have ooh, completed 70 members, planned another 19, so let's say they got 19, let's say we go for a 1 in 10 ratio. What do you think the 7, seven to 9 nuclear-powered Arleigh Burks would look like? Because, again, this would have been a very easy way to continue having a nuclear surface force that can escort the carriers. You're basically going, we're building everything the same, barring it's got the nuclear power plant. One in every ten. What do you think they'd look like? Do you think it was a good idea? Do you think the US Navy should have carried on doing that? I'll look forward to the comments, and thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed.